The reason you don't have answers is because you're trying to be the boss of your life instead of allowing God to be the boss. You're the servant, he's the boss. And when that happened, it was like, wow. And so then I decided I need to, to check out on the, the question that this professor had been challenging me with. And I found there were answers. And then there were more uh, questions. You know, the whole idea of evolution, I started looking at, wow, there are answers to these things. Uh, is the Bible true? Wow, there are answers to all this stuff. It was exciting. You and I care about truth and we care about communicating the truth of God on a simple level so that everybody can understand, yes, 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 it's actually true. Mm. Um, so what do you cover about, uh, what do you cover in this book titled Search for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem? Well, what I found is that people today are crying out for truth. They, uh, everything is inauthentic. You know, they, they can't trust the schools. They can't trust the government. They can't trust even their churches a lot of times. I think that's one of the reasons why you wrote letters to the churches, oh, man. Uh, to the Christian church. I'm sorry to say that's correct. Right. And so they're looking for truth. And so are the questions uh, of life answered in Vegas, which is represented chance, evolution? In other words, are we just a chance mixing of elements that um, uh, appear today, we die, and that's it? There's nothing else. Um, is it in Hollywood, which is representative of the force of Star Wars, Eastern mysticism, um, are we going to die and become part of a... Uh, a life force that exists out there and lose our individuality, that we become basically nothing. So the, the people that believe in chance become insignificant. The people that be, believe in uh, the force become nothing. Or are we going to become, uh, are, are we a, uh, a creation of an all-powerful, all-wise creator? But if that's true, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? And if that's, we're supposed the, that's to have a, the ultimate question, which correct. everyone will always ask. In other words, even, even if you come to believe in the God of the Bible as we have, you still, of course, uh, have good questions. And, and it's just that those questions don't overwhelm the truth of your faith because you realize, well, I know enough about God and about how much he loves me and how good he is that uh, even though I have questions, it, the, the questions cannot, cannot tear me away from what I know. But it's important to have answers to that. And this book really has been designed not for the Christian audience per particularly. Uh, it's actually designed for non-Christians. Interestingly, uh, I've been in the media industry uh, as an actor, as a voiceover spokesman for, for over 40 years. And during that time, I've had many, many conversations with people about God, about right. uh, the Bible. Uh, some people believe that, you know, how could you be so stupid, George, to believe that there actually is a God? Others were kind of wondering, you know, I got sort of this interest in God, but I'm not sure about the Bible. And then you got a bunch of people that are Christians, but they still have significant answers. And over the years, I wanted to have some book I could give to them. I didn't find any that I really liked. And so I finally decided to write one. Well, I love the idea that you are breaking this up. Uh, in other words, it's... Um you know, to say searching for truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, <laughs> you're giving us a way into these three modes, basically, right? And other people have written uh, similar things. I think of uh, Tom Thomas Howard, who wrote his book Chance of the Dance, 1969. Mm. But that's a very kind of highfalutin, very literary way into this, and he only deals with two of these ideas. But l let's let's get into it. Actually, before we get into it, I just want to uh, say again that. I, I think you and I, we bump into people all the time that have basic questions, and the culture is not giving them answers, and they're kind of, they've kind of become convinced that there are no answers, so they sort of stop asking, and they just kind of go with the flow. Right. But you know and I know that there are answers to this. And so in this book, you have those kinds of answers, and it is the kind of thing you can give to somebody who says, like, what about this? What about this? Well, read this book. Uh, so... When you say searching for truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, let's go through these three different ways of seeing things. So you use Vegas to say it's a crapshoot, it's completely random, right? Um, which, I mean, I've written about this in some of my books. It's If you actually follow that through to the bottom, that is deeply nihilistic and sick. But most people 
forget that. They just they they don't they don't follow it through to the bottom. They just go ah everything's just random and the universe came uh, into being through random processes and whatever. So t- talk about that worldview. Yeah, I. Uh I, I try to come up with three basic uh, reasons that evolution is wrong. Um, what I say is that uh, evolution uh, is contrary to the basic laws of science, and I point out the law of second dynamic. Uh, uh, Actually, okay, that's the first one. The second uh, law of thermodynamics. Right. And 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 you're right. The idea that science says, "Oh, we order emerged out of disorder. It just happened," and you think, "Well, wait a second. That's a really high bar. I mean, really? Because you're telling me it never happens, but except in this one time it happened. I was on the subway (laughs) a long time ago when I was working on this book, actually, originally. And um, I saw a sign up on the subway. It said it was for a technical school. It said, things break. That's why we always need skilled technicians. You don't drive a car and expect that it's going to get better. In fact, yesterday, my wife came and said, George, the car is running really rough, and it's not running on all the cylinders. Yeah. Um, things don't get better. They actually get worse. They break down. They break down over it's time. It's called entropy, and it right. proves... Okay, we're out of time. We'll be right back. We're talking to George <laughs> Saris. You can find him at George W. Saris, S-A-R-R-I-S, George W. Saris.com. The new book, Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. So the Vegas idea is everything's random, and people actually say that the whole universe and life and human beings emerged from nothingness, from randomness by itself, kind of created itself or, or whatever. And you were just talking about how in real life we know that never happens. Our cars break down. They, we they, die. They, people we die. die. We, really? Yeah. Okay. It's amazing. Everything goes bad yeah. <laughs> at the end. Right. It kind of falls apart. And so most people know that that's the, that's the way it is. So the idea that we're supposed to say yes, but except in the case of uh, evolution um, where it just happened to work in the other direction. But, you know, to be fair, mm-hmm. I can understand how people could buy that idea because when you talk about natural selection, you know, you, you, we've all heard it in school that, okay, you know, the giraffe with the longest neck uh, can reach the higher leaves and, and over generations giraffes will get longer necks. And you can get this idea in your head and you go, okay, that solves it. That makes sense. Except it doesn't really. It, it yeah. doesn't explain how you go from a, a, an amoeba to a whale. Right, exactly. But it pretends to explain it. Yeah. The problem with that really is that until a, a system is completely in place, it doesn't help an organism. It actually hurts it. So, for example, if you have um, a half a wing, right? I start out with no wings and I just get a half a wing. Well, that's not going to help you. If you have uh, part lung, part gills, that's not going to help you. It's actually going to probably kill you because you don't have what's uh, appropriately there. So this whole idea that things gradually developed into something new is actually quite foolish. I use the illustration of a car junkyard and I say, or a vehicle junkyard, and I say, um, if you apply uh, uh, evolutionary principles to a vehicle junkyard, you assume that what started out as a unicycle suddenly developed on its own into a bicycle, then a tricycle, then it goes to maybe a Fiat, uh, that guy <laughs> like Fiat, uh, then to a Chevy Corvette, and ultimately it gets to a BMW because right. that's the ultimate driving machine. Uh-huh. And then you have offshoots to cars or to uh, trucks and airplanes. Right. Or you can say, no, each one of those individual things was designed by a careful designer who was very wise and skillful. So what is the more reasonable conclusion? And I think, uh, again, we have to say that, you know, there's the common sense approach to this, which is what we're taking right now. But there's also the, you can look into the science, folks. This is, this is not like scientists aren't equally troubled by this, but they just, uh, many of them are so uh, in- invested in a certain worldview, they wouldn't dare mention uh, anything that might get them in trouble. But the fact of the matter is, I just had at Socrates in the City, we just had um, uh, uh, David Berlinski. He mm-hmm. wrote a book called, uh, he's written a number of books on this stuff. He's an agnostic. 
and he recognizes that so-called Darwinian evolution is just lunacy. I mean, it's not like they have no points, but at the end of the day, you would have to conclude, sorry, this is, it, it, it can't happen that way because the levels of complexity, if you ignore the levels of complexity, you say, well, I could see stuff happening, but then when you get down into how an eye develops or the idea of flight or any of these things, you, you realize that we're so far from actually being able to show that uh, that we've got to be we've got to be honest about it, and uh, you know this doesn't prove God. But if you're honest, you'd have to say, well, that we they've been selling this soap for 150 plus years, and the more we learn, the more difficult it is to think that 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 it really happened. But a- actually, what I love is that even before you get to evolution, is the idea of because uh, evolution presupposes life, and you say, okay, life, natural selection. But how do you get from non-life? to life, that's even more crazy. Mm. That really is like going to a junkyard and expecting the stuff, the wind, to create a, a working vehicle or something like that. Like, yeah. you, you know, there, there's no natural selection. It's just wind and rain and, and random processes. And you're saying, oh, we'll, we'll, end up, we'll end up with a cell eventually. It's like, no, you actually won't. You'll never end up with a cell. In fact, if you start with a cell, the cell will break down, like, which is what you just said. Um, should we talk more about that worldview? Because there are three worldviews. The book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. But but Vegas is the is the random right. That's the, that. It's chance. That's why it's Vegas. It's chance. You just kind of it's a crapshoot. I'm gonna right. throw the craps the the uh, dice down. Right. And, oh wow! I got seven. You know, but uh, it doesn't work that way in real life. Okay, so uh, one of the things I, I mentioned yeah. in there is uh, a hummingbird looking at a sophisticated helicopter, and two hummingbirds are there, and the one hummingbird says, "Well, you know, it's big, it's powerful, it can definitely go up and down and move around a lot better than a regular airplane." Hey, I'll give it an A for effort. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when you think of of what it takes to design a helicopter, right? You know, human beings didn't do that until oh, I don't know fairly recently in history, and, and, and obviously the same with airplanes. And then you look at something like a hummingbird, which is so small and so efficient and so magnificent. Um, it's, it's mind-bending. Let, let's talk about um, the second thing. And the book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. So Hollywood, what is the Hollywood? When you say Hollywood, what do you mean? What's the worldview there? The worldview there is basically the force of Star Wars. I mean, I use that. Um, it started out uh, a number of years. Actually, by the way, one little interesting piece of information. The uh, original Star Wars film debuted in 1977. Do you know how many theaters it opened in? No. 32. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. We need to fact check that. We'll be right <laughs> back talking to George Saris. The book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. You were just saying that in 77 when Star Wars uh, arrived, it only opened on 32 screens. Right. But it became so popular because it really combined sort of this idea of science and philosophy and Eastern mysticism. And it was right during the time when, in fact, I think George Lucas, if I'm not mistaken, was involved in um, Est, uh, which well, was I w- I wouldn't Earhart be something, whatever it was. Yeah. And um, so it was kind of his idea that, you know, and it's basically sort of a, a combination of Hinduism and Buddhism and, you know, a bunch of these Eastern mystic ideas, Zoroastrianism. So you have some of the... Um, the, the uh, the light and the dark are Zoroastrian, really. You've got a, a good being and you've got an evil being, and they kind of are always fighting with one another, that type of thing. And uh, then it, it, it developed more when it became Transcendental Meditation. Everybody was involved in that in the 70s, and then it became the New Age movement. And so it just kind of has taken over as the basic idea of our culture today. In fact, uh, many of the people I'll talk to, I'll, I'll say, yeah, by the way, what kind of religious background do you have? Oh. I'm not religious. I'm I'm spiritual. Yeah, it's the cliche right. of the century, folks. When you hear pe- whenever I hear anybody speak a cliche, I die a little bit because it's so pathetic. It's a, it's an excuse. I mean, it's an excuse. It's a substitute for actual thinking. So it's embarrassing to me for the person when they say things like that because they've been told that. 
they've been told that that's a safe thing to say, and that ends the conversation. But part of the reason is because they can't really trust what they've been brought up with. Right. They can't trust the schools. They can't trust their churches, unfortunately. Right. Of course. And they can't trust the government. And so right. they're, they're really expressing, I don't really know where I am. That's right. That's that, what's and happening. And that's the more generous way of looking at it, and you're right to point it out, because I think, and this is why I'm glad you wrote this book, Searching for Truth, I think there's so many people... Uh, they have basic questions, and they're not getting them answered. They're afraid to ask. I wrote a, a, a series of books years, 20 years ago called Everything I Always Want to Know About God, But We're Afraid to Ask, a similar concept that people are afraid to ask, whether it's the priest or the minister or their born-again neighbor. They're just they're afraid they're going to get it with both barrels, and so they kind of just are looking for clues in the culture, but they're not getting it. Right. And so that's why uh, people like you write books like Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. And you wrote, by the way, Atheism is Dead. Same kind of idea. Yes, in a lot that's of ways. It. that doesn't answer the questions that you do in this book, but it's, it deals with some of the same stuff. Yeah. But you answer the questions on a simple level because there are so many questions uh, uh, that you, you know, you're, you're, you're actually answering the questions uh, in this book. And when you talk about the default mode, that has come into American culture. You just said it is Hollywood. And it means, it says, well, I believe there's some force. There's some spirituality. I just don't know what it is. Uh, I'm a nice guy. I want to be in tune with good spirituality. It, it's very sloppy. It's, it, it doesn't ask anything of anyone. And it also is not logical mm. uh, at the end of the day. But uh, it's the best some people can do. And that's why Oprah Winfrey was so popular and why... Uh, a lot of these versions of New Age stuff are so popular because people are just, they're lost, but they know they need something. Nothing, you know, the brave atheist who says, I believe in absolutely nothing, you know, first of all, that's preposterous, but I'm saying that most people just aren't like that. Most people know there's something. And because churches and Christians maybe haven't sufficiently answered that, they kind of gravitate toward what you're talking about in Hollywood. Yeah, um, a lot of the people that say they're religious, but or they're not religious, but they're spiritual. It's not that they're atheist, but they just have real questions. Right. And they're they're looking for somebody or some group that can tell them answers. In fact, sometimes they're wondering if there even are answers. And uh, so what I was trying to do here was say yes, there really are. Um, the problem with uh, that whole Eastern mystic idea is that they're basically philosophical musings by thoughtful people, right. but that's it. There's nothing transcendent about it. In right. fact, one other little interesting thing that I found out in uh, my research, which I was kind of surprised at, um, you know, we've often said uh, the, uh, the tomb of Jesus was empty, but all the other people, they died. Do you know where Muhammad is buried? I do not. He's buried in Medina, Saudi Arabia. There's I was going to say... I was, I was pretty sure it was Grant's tomb. It's not Grant's tomb. <laughs> no, it's not Grant's no. tomb. But they act, there actually is a grave of Muhammad. It's protected by uh, people that are, I guess, whatever they do, they protect it, you know, watch it over. It's a, a covered uh, uh, tomb, and that's where his body is. Uh, Confucius is buried in the cemetery of Confucius in Khufu, Shandong Province, China. Buddha was actually cremated in, I think it's Kandagar, I can't remember what the name of it, Kashindagar, Kish, whatever it is. And, yeah, thank you. But uh, he was actually cremated, and the bones, because when you cremate someone, the bones don't get destroyed, were given out to various people, and so they are relics, they're relics around of Buddha. Then, of course, you have Jesus, who, oh, he wasn't there. I do want to ask you, mm -hmm. in this shorter segment, when did you find faith? How did that happen for in your life? I, um, I grew up, uh, a couple of interesting things. I didn't find out until I was in my 40s that my mother's father, toward the end of his life, was ordained as a Greek Orthodox priest. It was amazing to me. Nobody told me that. It's kind of fascinating. But I grew up, we went to Protestant churches, because when he first came over from the old country, he brought his children to Episcopal churches, because they didn't have any Orthodox churches at the time. In New Hampshire. No, this was in upstate New York. Upstate, that, that's called, where you were, upstate New York. Yeah, a small yeah. town called Johnstown, New York. And um, anyway, uh, so I grew up in a Protestant background, but you know, I always wondered, is there a God? I think there's a God. Jesus, I'm not too sure what he did. Anyway, so I went to college at Northwestern University from 1966 to 1970. And uh, 
there was a professor there who seemed to have as his goal to destroy the faith of any students. And uh, so I just kind of bought into what he said. I mean, he brought up some questions about the Bible and stuff like that. And so I thought, well, that's not what was happening. And then at the end of my junior year in college, I met some Christians that had a different focus on life. They were part of a group called Campus Crusade for Christ. They've changed the name now to Crew. But um, they shared a little booklet with me. A man, In fact, the book is dedicated to Conrad Cook, who uh, was the person that actually changed my life by sharing that little book that with me. But it, basically what it was saying is the reason you don't have power in your life, the reason you're not seeing God answer prayer, the reason you're not experiencing peace and joy, the reason you don't have answers is because you're trying to be the boss of your life instead of allowing God to be the boss. You're the servant. He's the boss. And when that happened, it was like, wow. And so then I decided I need to, to check out on the, the question that this professor had been challenging me with. And I found there were answers. And then there were more uh, questions. You know, the whole idea of evolution. I started looking at that. Wow, there are answers to these things. Uh, is the Bible true? Wow, there are answers to all this stuff. It was exciting. And so then uh, I graduated from college, uh, worked with Campus Crusade for Christ for about four years in their uh, headquarters when it was in California, then went to seminary, uh, got an MDiv at uh, Gordon Conwell Seminary. And while I was in seminary, I thought, you know, there's a need for godly individuals to get into positions of influence within secular institutions. And I was interested in uh, the media, and so I thought, well, I'll just get into the media. Why is it that the media is communicating so much junk all the time? Because they're junky people. And what you need is to have some people that can actually have good thoughts, godly thoughts, that are producing the programming. And so uh, at the time, I decided to basically be a tent maker missionary. And so I was uh, working in the Boston area at that time, and then in 1991, moved to New York. And uh, that's how I ended up meeting you and working, yeah. trying to share my faith. But it's just amazing to me that this happened in college. I just love when I hear stories like this, that somebody's in college, and suddenly the lights go off, or the, 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 or the, the bulb goes off, and you start to... I mean, I, it happened to me after college, mm. but... That moment when you realize, wait a minute, uh, there are tons of great answers and books and stuff, and I didn't, I had no idea that all these objections that people say, well, what about this? What about that? There are satisfying answers to these things, and so I started reading all these different books. And as far as I'm concerned, I've I've written some of those books now, and this book that you've written is one of those books. It's called Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. Uh, it answers all kinds of questions that everyone uh, has. You know, did Jesus really rise from the dead? What about this thing called pain? Why would God allow pain to exist? Uh, all of these important questions have great answers. We will continue talking. That's the end of hour one. Uh, but my guest is George Saris, and the book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. You dismiss the uh, the idea of Vegas and Hollywood. Uh, we've talked about that. So Bethlehem, um, I think for a lot of people, you were one of those people, and I was one of those people. We're like, well, I'm okay with the idea of God, but ah, the Jesus thing seems mm. a little maybe that's too specific or something like that. So where do you take it? Well, one of the things I, I mentioned is about um, is Jesus the Messiah. That's a big question, and, you know, because you, you got a whole realm of Jewish people that don't believe that, right? Uh, it suddenly struck me, there's really only three things you need to know to point out a specific individual in the entire world, and then four if you want to have an extra confirmation. For example, I am the only person in the history of the world, before, currently, or ever at will be, who's named George W. Saris, born in a small upstate New York town between the end of World War II and the beginning of the 2000 uh, millennium. There's nobody else in the history of the world that fits that. And then a little confirmation is that I wrote a book in 2023 titled Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem, The Quest to Discover if God is Real. Nobody else fits that. Well, you look back at Jesus, all you need to know is, what's his name? He's from the line of David. I'm from the line of Sarah's. Where was he born? Bethlehem, very specific that it says that in Scripture. When was he born? You can get some specific, uh, I, I talk about Isaac Newton, who points out actually the specific 
date that Jesus was supposed to have risen from the dead. But even in more general terms, you have the, the prophecy from Jacob that says, before the, or, uh, uh, the Messiah will come when the, the, um, uh, the ruler's staff is taken from Judah. That happened in 70 AD. Prior to that, there still was a ruler's staff in Israel, but when the second temple was destroyed completely, that was done. So that means that the Messiah had to be from the line of David. He had to be uh, uh, coming sometime prior to 70 AD. Prior, prior to 70 AD. Pr- prior to Obviously, 70 AD. right. And uh, then the confirmation is the virgin birth that specifically talks that this person is going to come. He's going to be born of a virgin. Well, there's nobody else in the history of the world that fits that. It's really pretty phenomenal. Well, actually, it's interesting because a lot of people would say, oh, that's mythical, or they, they just would, would, wouldn't believe it. But the point is that uh, th- there's no one who even claims that. Uh, and it is specific when you read it in the scripture. It's really clear that it's not just a young woman, because when they referred to a young woman, they specifically meant a virgin young woman, because if you were not a virgin, you were no longer uh, a young woman. You were now married or you were whatever. And yeah, there, there's so many things. Again, if somebody dares to look into this stuff, they're going to be shocked at how much evidence there is. Because if you want to kind of glide through life, you can kind of pretend, well, there's no evidence. There's a lot of different points of view. Well, I dare you, if you want to know, to look into these things. I mean, you can start with George's book, Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. But if you, if you really are hungry to know, first of all, can I know, right? Because we say, like, is there truth? Well, even if there is truth, the first question would be like, hey, if there is a thing called truth and about the God, can I know that truth? Or is it just some truth that I, I, that's not accessible to me? 